powering you through uh, digital citizenship flash session. Um, the flash session is a new format for the IGF. We are the guinea pigs. I think we may be the first one. So we're not quite sure how it's supposed to work, but we'll make the best of it. Um, we, some of the folks up here at the, at the front who will introduce themselves in a second were involved in a workshop last year and previous years at IGFs. Um, we wanted to take the concept that we had in Baku last year, which was a workshop with no presentations, no PowerPoints, and no panelists, and bring it forward because we felt it was such a, an exciting and a helpful format for the topics that we're discussing. Um, just to give you an idea, last year during a 90-minute session, we had nearly 30 different people speak at the moment. So if you don't raise your hand, I probably will call on you. We want to get this to be very highly interactive. Uh, we know it's early in the morning and the room is a little warm, but uh, I think the best panels you'll find at the IGF sessions are the most interactive, and we certainly want this to be one of those. So uh, with that, I think I'll turn it over to Kim, and uh, I'll start to play Mr. Microphone. Great. Thanks, Jim, and thanks for coming this morning. And like Jim said, we do want to make this a really interactive session because we want to hear from you. That's the whole point. I'm Kim Sanchez, and I'm with Microsoft. Colleague over here, Jacqueline Bisser. And we started this conversation about youth and digital citizenship in Vilnius at the IGF in Lithuania three or so years ago. There weren't very many youth at that IGF, unfortunately. So the, the, it, was, it was more uh, adults talking to each other. Then we took it to Nairobi, and the kids there really told us that the concept of digital citizenship, that they didn't like the term citizen citizenship because there weren't necessarily the rights and responsibilities that come with that term. And so they, they kind of took objection to that. Last year in Baku, the UK youth who were in our session really liked the term and said it worked for them. But a lot of other youth said they had the problem with the, the word digital. And that was the first time I'd heard that. And they said, we're just citizens of the world. And I really like that concept. So we want to kind of take that the, the past few years and see where we are here in Bali. And we want to know from you, is this term digital citizenship relevant? Does it work for you? Are you talking about the concept of, of the safe and appropriate use of technology with your parents within in the school, uh, within your peers? So um, I'm going to let Larry Magic uh, uh, ask the first question here, but those are the kind of the, the things we want to talk about. And since we only have 30 minutes, we do want to be as brief as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim. So I looked up the word citizen in the dictionary, which is a very impressive online dictionary site. And you might think, based on the conversation about digital citizenship, we would say citizen is obedient, citizen is responsible, citizen is good, and pay the taxes. But actually, the very first definition was a citizen is a free person. And it got later to I guess part of what I want to learn from you is what do you envision citizenship is? Often adults talk about digital citizenship and another way of saying it's behavior citizenship. And so you can do this once you're done in class or whatever, whatever it is. But if I read the dictionary correctly, it means a lot more than that. So I'd like to get a sense of what it means to be a citizen, a truly a citizen, in this global community where borders are meaningless, where laws often don't even apply anyway. How do you create a society where you're not only responsible, but you're also empowered and, and as a dictionary says, free people? So let's start off with you. Feel free. So citizenship for me is, I think it's not about being submissive or passive, it's about, about being interactive with other people and so a citizen is engaged with the other citizens and has impact on policy and stuff like that. So basically, active participation in society. Oh, sorry. I'm Eline van Omen. I'm a student at LSE, and I'm with the Dutch IGF. Maybe somebody can talk about what that means in global internet environment. It's different than like a UN meeting. I'm first. My name is Robert Alter from the Dutch delegation. Um, I, I think active participation in the digital space 
uh, for me personally means also thinking about how you can make the web a better place or how you can uh, actually maybe even build a living on, on the web and also improve and build. I mean, um, we think about the internet and we have a multi-stakeholder approach and what it actually means is anyone can um, actively participate in, in the online space, whether it be good or bad, but always from your own intentions, you can actually uh, change the space, whether for good or for bad. Well, I'm going to finish with team. I'm also from the Netherlands. I'm Bastian. Um, I think for me the most important thing of citizenship is that you belong to a society or a group or a digital group. And I think that's the most important thing. Uh, we in the Netherlands think that you're, we are all more or less equal, you know. So you belong to a group and you're all equal in this group. And I think that's very important. All right, we can't have a Dutch monopoly on answers here. So who else wants to join? Thank you. Fiona McIntosh from the Alana and Madeline Foundation in Australia. I think um, the notion of citizenship has both the contribution effort that the Dutch delegation was talking about. There's also a, there's a give and a take. I think there's expectations that if you're a citizen, there are some some uh, protections around you and the group of citizens will agree on what they, they are and that you'll contribute to the conversation about setting those boundaries and the infrastructure around you. But if I can ask, when you, when you think about being a citizen of a country, a city, we have laws. There's certain things that the government can do. In the internet, we have much less of them. So how do we establish these norms, these patterns? And for lack of a better word, how do we enforce them? Necessarily have a government to dictate what we're supposed to do and send police officers over if we don't do it right. My microphone, Larry. How you govern an organization which is essentially ungovernable, uh, yet somehow I think we're supposed to do it. I think you can. I think you cannot. Um, you know, govern what people do on the internet. I mean, you can set some regulations on the possibilities of the internet, but you can't decide what people do and not do on the internet. For example, downloading torrents. It's almost impossible to check whether they do or not do drones do that things. So I think we should, um, that's very important in our mindset on this point, I think. You just got a lot of hands in, up in the air. Good job. <laughs> um, uh, in Indonesia, it's not exactly ungoverned because there's a example of you saying that he's an atheist on Twitter or anything. He's actually being captured and in jail. So um, it's not because the government probably doesn't monitor the internet, but other people do, and they actually go to the uh, authorities. Hi, um, Bianca from uh, NetMission. So uh, to me, I think digital citizenship is more of a consciousness because there isn't a global governing role um, on the internet. So it's the consciousness to instill in people. Just like citizenship, sometimes you say, oh, you go to Metro and you should, um, uh, if there's a pregnant woman, you should you know, walk aside and give her the seat, right? So I think that's more of a consciousness rather than um, or something that can be enforced. Edwin from Dot Asia. You started off by saying that that you saw on the on the uh, dictionary that that first sort of meaning is is to be a free man. I guess that that came from the probably the the Greek uh, free man those kind of things. And I think one important part of being free is is to not only you know to, to know the boundaries of of liberty as well, and that's sort of like wrapped up in the rights, responsibilities, and 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 respect. Um, so it's not, you know, uh, I think that that's what citizenship means and it doesn't really matter whether you're online or offline. The other thing you mentioned is in terms of um, um, that on the internet, it's, it's, it's difficult to govern, you know, people violate rules and stuff. I, I like to uh, uh, kind of challenge that because, um, uh, first of all, I think the laws of land still applies on most of the activities you, you do on the internet. The other thing is that on in the real world, it doesn't mean in the real world not a lot of people are violating rules and laws uh, just because we can't catch them. Uh, on the internet, it's different. Everything is logged. Everything is, you know, you can trace it back down. And therefore, you can see 
more of the abuse, more of the, you know, like cyberbullying for, for one example. You, know, you can see it more because you have the evidence. Uh, but in, in physical bullying, you not a lot of people have seen it because, you know, you, you don't have the evidence there all the time, anytime, anywhere. So um, I, I guess it's not that people have changed, you know, suddenly change into law unabiding citizens on the internet. So, um, you know, I guess that, that that's just the point. It's just that the internet gives you a, a very good uh, evidence of what happened. I'll uh, keep it short. Um, I, I like that you mentioned like the real world because I think of the internet as just like, um, yeah, like uh, uh, an extra part of your world and uh, of the physical world. But what it means is that also the morals and laws you have in real life um, apply it to online as well, especially morals. I mean, yes, you can see people being bullied, but then yes, also you as a citizen have to respond from your morals, whether you go with the guy bullying or you say, hey, cut it out, man, it's not nice. I mean, yes, it's more clear, it's more transparent, but it's just like the real world. It's the world. It is the world. So how do you stand up? I think you said it earlier. How do you create a better internet? How do we do that? And that's actually going to be the safer internet day thing uh, for 2014. So what do you do when you see things that you don't like? I mean, how do you take action with those things? Well, I think now a big influence has the websites on which you comment or which you bully. So in a sense, there could be some regulations about that. I think the responsibility lies in the first place with the person who does that. So people should have this feeling that what hurts somebody in the real world, even if the internet is just as real, also applies online. So it's not that people are just being in, have no feelings if they're online. So the responsibility now lies more with the website, but I think in the end it would be better if we have some universal declaration of some kind of what, so that all the websites are using in a way as a guideline. Anyone else? That's an interesting concept, kind of principles or declarations you call them. What do you guys think about that? These are the norms that we expect. Um, I'm a bit worried about the uh, non-existent freedom in the internet. Like, uh, it's interesting to see from the teenagers' perspective that the internet should be governed. But uh, from a more adult perspective, uh, I think, like, I'm worried about this guy who's actually being captured because he said he claimed that he's an atheist in Britain. He thinks he has freedom in the internet, but it turns out that he doesn't. And uh, it's more like I would like to give, um, how, how do you say, like some kind of a warning, like uh, you probably doesn't really have that much freedom in the internet for the teenage, so you don't get in trouble, even though you express yourself in the internet, you don't get in trouble in real life. Uh, hi, it's Jeremy Blackman from Alana Melbourne Foundation in Australia. Um, I just wanted to introduce an idea of, um, we're talking about um, governance and enforcement, but also I think an important part of um, um, kind of governance is leadership as well. So it's about citizenship in the offline world and a kind of governance role is also to provide vision around values and activism. Um, but, but another problem with the internet, of course, is just like with enforcement, um, leadership is also in some ways a nebulous thing. Who is, who is leading the, the values and the uh, yeah, I just raised my hand because of what you said. I think it's really important that people are really actually aware of that what they say on the internet is not anonymous, never. But then on the other hand, what you said about um, that they got arrested, I think that is a problem because then the local government interferes with what people say on the internet. And people need to be aware of that, but then I hope that in the end that can change and there can be actual like freedom in that sense on the internet. But yeah, you're right, it's absolutely still a big problem that in a lot of countries it's not yet there. Well, I don't know if you're saying that the internet is actually being governed, and that's actually what's happening in the Netherlands. Um, there are people being arrested because they um, 
threatening people on the internet. But there's a large flaw in that because you um, take it as a given fact that um, the one who has, whose account is posting the tweet um, is actually owned by the um, respected um, owner in the real world. But I can make an account in his name and tweet a thread to someone. But you don't know if it has been me or him. Um, and that's a big flaw. And there are other flaws. You can check if it was uh, actually on your iPhone and if you was managing that iPhone. So you can't really um, make good evidence if it's true on how you was um, supposed to tweet. And that's a big flaw in internet governance. One of you made an interesting comment about activism on the web and how a citizen online can take an active role in improving their community. What might that look like? I mean, in, we, we have plenty of history of people rolling up their sleeves and building parks and cleaning up and messes. But on the internet, what does it mean to take an active role? And what is a community anyway? Indonesian, Dutch, or racing from Indonesia. Uh, since I'm from Wikimedia Indonesia, I never actually say who I am. Um, what interesting in Indonesian case is actually the languages, the native languages in Indonesia is actually dying. And Wikipedia is actually giving um, sub server to actually, if their uh, initiative to actually live in the language. And what interesting to me is, I thought it would be the adult that started the native language in the internet. It's not, it's actually teenager. So I think that empowerment, and it's an, an empowerment that wasn't exactly started by the government or anyone else, it's by them. Yeah, I, I think that's amazing. I think what's great about the internet and what can promote active participation because it's so easy to write a blog, give your opinion, talk about things that you worry you, share it with other people. So it's like this contact zone on the internet is so big, and then you see that. Like also, it's not only in English, but that people also talk in other languages on the internet and start a community, which is, in a way, smaller but maybe more powerful than just this global internet community, but also this local uh, active engagement is really important as well. How do you feel just your, your point that um, you know, what, what does it mean by the community and what does it mean by by in that sense? I think. One of the things that I, I find interesting is that um, you can do a lot of things on, on the internet, you know, you can write a blog and those kind of things, but I think one thing that, that it seems interesting is you know, when it breaks into the, the physical world as well, when, when a movement uh, that starts in the, on the internet gets the momentum and then, you know, spins out into the, the physical world, because then, then you can really see the community, uh, you know, not just the uh, online discuss forums or, or blogs here, that um, things like ACTA, when you know, people pour it out to the street, you know, SOPA, and those kind of things. And, and in Hong Kong, there was a case where uh, a, a movement that started on the internet drew 200,000 people that came out, you know, in, to protest the government. That's the kind of, you know, community. I think the digital building from the digital uh, uh, world into, you know, real citizenship. So, so that sort of bridges what, what, what we're calling digital citizenship, almost like exclusive, but really. Uh, and coming back to the point about last year, is it's really just citizens of the world. It's a medium that, that connects people, and then that community you know, uh, really gets reflected in, in the real world. Thoughts? Yeah, I think it's important to say what he said. But no, what, what I think is interesting uh, when it comes to online activism or actually anything online, especially when we're talking about citizenship, is that the, uh, I think the question came from what, what, what uh, part of, what kind of citizen are you? Are you a citizen of a city or a community? And I think the really great thing about the internet is that you can become a citizen of any kind of community. It's very easy to connect and, and gain an audience for your activity or for your cause. Um, which brings me to a second thought, which I wanted to share with this earlier. It's when it comes to uh, drawing a line about morals or law in law. Um, it's difficult. And um, 
Uh, for example, you 4chan and those kinds of forums, which are a bit more aggressive, they're more anonymous, they're more um, uh, discriminating, they're more criminal most of the time, and um, more bullying. When you look, for example, at Facebook, it's a totally kind of different platform. There's ac actually um, active involvement in stopping cyberbullying and reporting stuff. So the morals differ on different platforms for different parts of the society, citizens. So yeah, that you should take that in mind when you're talking about drawing the line. Well, actually, I have a nice example for this. Um, in the Netherlands, I live in a city called Leiden, with around 300k people. And um, on a Sunday, someone posted a message on 4chan saying, "Tomorrow, I'm going to kill my Dutch teacher. I'm going to kill my Dutch teacher." Um, and he posted a picture of a weapon that was found four years ago on the internet already, but he said, tomorrow I'm going to kill my teacher. And the police ordered to close the schools for three days. And there were thousands of kids, tens of thousands of kids that couldn't go to school just because of a measure of fortune. And actually, I'm um, curious to what you guys think. Is it a good, um, a good action for police to close down the schools? Or should, should they just have ignored the measures? They they, uh, they couldn't find um, the guy who posted it because it was posted via a proxy server in Colombia somewhere. Actually, after a month they found him, but at the moment they didn't know who it was. So it's a good action or not? I don't know if we have any law enforcement people in the room, but that is a classic conundrum. Law enforcement has to go through it. I don't think that's an internet problem, but you know, we, we deal with that all the time. In fact, this whole NSA surveillance scandal is really about far do we need to go to protect society, how many rights do we need to take away, how many people do we need to spy on, how many students do we need to inconvenience, and maybe one in 100,000 chances to just kill people. And that's a very good thing. I don't have the answer to that. Yeah, I just also had a question relating to that, because I was wondering, if we talk about Facebook, um, it's always, Facebook has this policy about using your own name and your want to say real identity and then on websites like 4chan you can be anonymous so I was wondering what everybody thinks about morals and law on the internet if you want if you can be anonymous we'll yield to a new uh, speaker uh, yes my name is Willie Lovett. I happen to be uh, a circumvention tool developer myself, so I have <laughs> some expertise in how people use anonymous uh, proxies. The thing is that, uh, like any conduit, you cannot control, as a provider of the, this service, what people will see. Just like any tool you have, just like a, I mean, a knife, you can use a knife for a good purpose or bad purpose. So it comes down to the models of people, and I suggest strongly against the idea of trying to prevent, because when you begin using prevent, you end up using preemptive action and we saw in real life how preemptive action led to wars you know the Iraq war but then it's also analogous to the case when you want to prevent cyber crime trying to use surveillance and some other tactics the better and the higher ground is to use awareness and to think in the long run uh, because every community has its users and so using awareness and campaigns of education is perhaps the only way I like that, and it's going to be my next question. How do, how do you teach people about this concept? You guys are a little bit older, and maybe, did you get to talk when you were younger in school? Did your parents have to talk with you? Who's responsible for educating people about the responsibility and awareness? Well, first of all, I think it's, um, again, I think, uh, it comes from different kinds of rooms, from, from parents who actually care about each other, that is their very, uh, how do you say, it? their motivation to teach you is virtue, but then again, I have another vision about learning uh, about the internet and morals on the internet, and um, uh, what I think about is, is you can learn from the, from the failures of other people on the internet, because it's also transparent and very connected, you can actually see what happens. For example, in the Netherlands, we had a time when people um, tweeted, yeah, I'm going to going to burn down my school or something like that. And uh, when they um, called uh, two or three girls um, for some time, those tweets, they stopped because everybody 
so okay if I'm going to plead something like this under the law I, I can be called by the police for that and I'm going to be uh, put in jail or something and the same happened to me it wasn't like uh, I said I'm going to burn out my school but I, but I was criticizing a company and um, apparently you're not allowed to criticize a company uh, in the Netherlands before you gave them a chance to respond to your criticism so don't yeah so what happens now I'm teaching you the lesson about you can't criticize um, a company in the Netherlands on Twitter. And so you think, oh, I have to remember it. And of course, it's, it's, uh, it's really worse when people are put in jail, for example, because of tweets. But it sets an example for everyone in the country that sees it so people can actually learn from it. I think this is one of the best ways to actually teach more on the internet. Hello, I'm Vivian from Matt Mission. Um, about the question uh, who has the responsibility to educate the people to use internet? And people always say that parents or school or teachers are qualified to do it. But I would like to share an example because, like, um, on my team, and my parents are like 15 or 16. So, actually, when they were young, they did not have computers or they did not have internet. So, basically, they do not have the knowledge to teach the children to use the internet. So I doubt whether parents really have the qualification to educate children. So instead of that, I think the service provider actually has the responsibility to teach because they are the one who provide the service. So they should take the responsibility to educate the users on how to use the service so that they um, know how to do it correctly. I just said, as a parent of an eight and a ten year old, um, is it just following up? Should I, as a parent, become familiar with this and then teach it? Isn't it that part of the responsibility of passing that information along? Yeah, of course, but I, I believe there's still a gap between different generations. For example, like my parents, actually I'm the one who teaches them to use the computer. That leads me to something else that we always talk about. Kids are always going to be ahead of their parents on the technology, there's no doubt. but parents who have life wisdom and experiences to pass on and the notion of, you know, this doesn't feel right or too good to be true, probably is it's those kinds of lessons that we always say, you may not know the technology, but you've got these other lessons that are very valuable to learn. Hello, my name is Jutta Kroll from Germany and uh, we have the experience that, yes, parents as well as teachers can play an important role, but we still have um, a huge group of young people whose parents don't know anything about the internet who are still, maybe they are just not fit to do that, not only because of knowledge, but because maybe they are not interested or they're living in dis disadvantaged social uh, relationships, so they have problems to keep up with their children. But then also social work can play an important role because social workers, somehow they care, especially for families and for children, they live in this that live in disadvantaged environments, and they also they are kind of trusted by by the young people as well. So, especially for disadvantaged groups, this is a very uh, successful approach. One area for activism for young people, 4-H in the United States is a very large organization and has mentors, young people, teaching older people how to use technology. So, if the parents don't know, kids can step up and teach them something. And also the white person. Hi, I'm Mike uh, Sorry, I'm also from the Netherlands. But um, <laughs> I wanted to add that I don't think that, that parents should know uh, just as much about technology as children do. I think more, it's more a matter of being curious about your child's online life and discussing it and talking about it and what I see in my practice is that um, I talk a lot with children and teenagers about online sexual abuse and what I see is that a lot of children that I talk to they tell me that they they never talk about their online world with their parents so what I see is that I think parents should be more curious and just ask more questions about what your child is doing and not about like um, moderating their online life, but just being curious and ask questions. So you have like a safe space as a child to just, just go your, to your parents and ask questions if ever something is going wrong.
going back to the question about how do you create that that change and, and, and awareness around digital citizenship, in Australia we have a, a vision of creating an e-smart Australia where everyone is smart, safe and responsible online. And I think NGOs have an important role to, to actually engender those behaviours. I think more so than government and civil society, there's a real gap for NGOs to step into that space. At the Alana Madeline Foundation, we have a series of cultural change programs to embed those behaviours in settings where children and young people interact with technology. In 2000 schools across Australia, they participate in the eSmart Schools program, which is basically a roadmap for creating a cyber safe school. In every public library, library across Australia, they, libraries go through a similar process, take, um, taking all the necessary actions to ensure that they're protecting their users and the libraries are cyber safe. And we're about to launch a similar mini home audit for parents to create an e-smart home. And then finally, we're also creating an, an, a digital license. Like when you're young and you learn how to write and you get a pen license, this is getting a license to play smartly, safely and responsibly on the internet where children work through a series of eight modules with the appropriate knowledge and information they need to be safe online. And once they've completed the modules, they get awarded a digital license. Now, in isolation, each of those initiatives would probably be not valuable, but we see the value is that every setting where children and young people are interacting with technology, they're getting the same messages reinforced. Smart, safe, responsible. So at school, in libraries, in the home when they're just using their own mobile. So having that connected and consistent message we think is really important. Similarly, if we think back to you know, 10 or 15 years ago, messages about wearing seat belts in cars or stopping smoking, we've adopted those principles of community behavioural change where you have those, those consistent multi-layered interventions that um, are through advertising and media but supported by infrastructure and legal and policy frameworks to reinforce those behaviours. And I think we won't get any change unless we have a consistent approach like that. I know, yeah, we have another session that starts at 9.45, so you guys need more than like five minutes for transition. Is anybody leading that session? All right, we'll go till somebody starts yelling. Well, I think that we should remember that on the internet, just common sense. I mean, would you give your credit card to a stranger on the street that you don't trust? I mean, it's the same on the internet. Would you give your credit card to a website that you don't trust or you don't know? I um, mean, that's the same. It's the same for posting um, threats on the internet, like I'm going to burn down my school. You don't say that in real life, so why would you do it on the internet? And parents can teach their kids that kind of lessons. I mean, it's the same common sense that's being used in the real world that goes on to the internet world, to the digital world. And it isn't that much different. Hi, my name is Tamara and I'm from Hong Kong and I'm an ICD Network Ambassador. Um, so I'm only 16 years old. I, I can only speak for the, the youth and kids. And I actually want to comment about um, whose responsibility is to take care, I mean, not take care, I mean, um, deal with cybercrime. And if we're going to speak of it, um, speak of cybercrime being a moral issue, which I totally agree with because um, I actually did an, an essay about cyberbullying and research, full on research. And um, what I found is that you can't continue to get it's a moral issue. And because I speak for the youth and children only, um, you know, who, who do they spend their time most with? Obviously, their parents and, and teachers too. So education is very important. I feel like, I, 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 I feel like, um, workshops should be implemented more, not only for the kids, but for parents also. Because although, yes, no matter how close the generation gap may be or how far it may be, kids are always going to know more about the internet than parents. That's just, you know, like 10 years or 5 years from now, the generation below me is always going to know more. And actually, I want to comment about, um, I actually want to comment about the principles and values. Um, because although, you know, Human rights does not mean your regulations, but at the same time, um, the principles and values of the internet is threatened when policy makers regulate and control the internet. So, um, actually, I'm aware of um, 
like child I mean on child online security commissions around the world they're like spread across like 40 something countries like Canada and the UK which basically like monitors child situation cooperate, cooperate with different corporations and, and listen to the children's voice um, in Hong Kong there's no such thing because, but there is a thing called family commission which the government thinks is not but then again you know, the government does not know everything about the internet it's very open and it's also come from like the technical aspect of the internet so um, yeah and I right into it. Thanks. It was actually going to be a question. I'm Dr. Beauchere. I'm Kim Coy from Microsoft in the United States. And I was going to respond to your question um, from Australia, your comment about behavioral change, something that we advocate for um, at Microsoft. It's a very difficult process the behavior. Um, but what I'm asking is, what's really going to drive people to action to do that? Because our experience has been, unfortunately, if something bad happens, their child has been cyber bullied, or they've been infected with a worm or a virus, or their identity has been stolen. To really get them to take those proactive measures to step out and do the right thing and educate themselves and others and their families, what's going to really empower them and drive them to do that? Now I'm caught with two microphones. Not a good place to be. Is, is, are the organizers of the second session in the room? No, not yet. All right. That's a terrific and, and really multi-layered question. I think that you know, in our research, you're, you're absolutely right that, that parents take action if someone they know, whether it's their child or a friend's child, has been um, affected. Um, what, that's why we think that the, the behavioural chain, societal behavioural chain approach is the only way to work. You need to have some policy and legislative, legislative framework that, that um, reinforces so, for example, in Australia with sunscreen, what happened was that um, 20 years ago, no one worried about it, but then what happened was children weren't allowed to go uh, outside at lunchtime and play if they didn't bring a hat. So there was a consequence. Um, you, um, so parents had to buy hats for their kids because the kids would come home from school and say, I'm not allowed outside, Mum, buy me a hat. So we need to think about the parallels of that in the digital world, and I'm not sure what they are, but having the, the consequences, or sorry, sorry, the policy uh, framework around it. Well, you know, it's very interesting about that because I think a lot about this notion of safety and fear-mongering. There's a great deal of people who are constantly telling us how dangerous the Internet is. But if you think about everything else in the world, driving, um, sports, I, I've never heard of any responsible adult tell children they shouldn't play sports, yet every year someone dies in sports. I mean, people literally are killed. That doesn't happen online. And so there is this notion that somehow the internet has to be held to a higher standard of safety than the rest of the world. And I, I never quite understood that. I uh, really agree with the behavioral change and all the tactics and strategies you can build upon that, and you could enforce it through policies. But you could also like, um, uh, I mean, it starts, off, for example, with everyone that actually has an influence on anyone, and that's actually everyone. Sounds weird, but I mean parents, teachers, etc. You can enforce them. You can you can have them um, be by example and have them uh, raise awareness, etc. By policy, but where it starts is awareness. And I mean, you can force people to actually teach morals. And where it starts is that you actually inspire and you can motivate it to actually teach morals. So it starts with awareness. And I think we're not yet in the stage in any country we can start enforcing uh, certain morals. Online, you still need to raise a lot of awareness. So the only thing I can say is when you're going to start any strategy or any any um, policy, whether you're an uh, uh, NGO or a school, um, really embed the awareness in it. That people really understand why they are needing um, behavioral change. All right, I, I'm assuming the organizers for the second session are here. So I'm going to, since you were brave enough to go first, I'll let you have the last comment. I just want to say I really agree with what you said, and I think also like, if we want to empower youth, we can't just make up all these rules and try to protect them as if they are ignorant. We really need to empower them and trust them and know that they can do it because they can. So I think I want. To On that note, I want to put in one advertisement this Thursday uh, at 16:30, 4:30, 30, 
did a workshop on rights versus protection. We want to explore the extent to which protecting young people affects their actual rights, whether there's a conflict between protection rights. And we're hoping as many young people as possible come. So I would urge you all to come Thursday at 4.30, 15.30. I'm not sure exactly what room it's in, but um, it's uh, what is it? It is Wulu Watu 5. Thank you very much. Excellent session. Thanks.